Welcome everyone uh, to our panel discussion about the Census 2010 and why it's important. Um, before we get started, I'd like to ask Sarah Garrett, Vice President of Academic Affairs, to come up and greet everyone. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just very, very happy that you've taken time out of your schedule to, to come and be a part of this important discussion because the census is extremely important. The information that you glean from today's discussion, and it is a discussion that will be interactive, so please ask questions. It is very important, the impact that it will have upon your communities, Take this information back to your families, to your friends, to your neighbors, because the census has an impact on benefits, on redistricting voting rights, um, what it does in terms of the, the appropriations that will come down. And this time, in these economic times, more than ever, the census is very important. So for you to take the time to come out and become more informed about these issues says a lot about your character. So thank you for being here um, this afternoon. But be an active participant in these discussions. Ask questions and add, if you have information to add to these discussions, please join in. That's what I love about this college. You know, we're a family. So add in, be a part of this. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great morning. The sun is out. I'm from Baltimore. Everybody there is all snowed in, so at least we don't have you know, the 80 inches of snow that they've been dealing with uh, for this past week. So let's get started. Thank you so much, Bob. OK, I want to kind of just set things up on how this uh, event will go. Um, we have a, a group here of panelists who I'm going to introduce in a second. And what we're going to do is have a couple of short presentations, but the majority of the time will be, uh, allow will be allowed for you to have questions or ask questions about anything about the census. Um, and what I'll do is I'll actually have the mic and I can, if you just kind of raise your hand, I can come out and I'll ask you to speak into the mic. And um, we'll get the panelists to give their thoughts on anything you want to ask. Um, when we got started uh, setting up events for African American History Month, um, we had a lot of different uh, thoughts about what we could do. Um, and part of the brainstorming, we came up with doing something about the census. Um, and well, some of the some of the questions that within our group we were asking, well, why why do a, a an event based on the census? Um, I'd like to share a little bit of info that I recently ran across. Um, the Pew Research Center is a they're a specialist that do polling uh, in the United States. Um, they conducted a poll this just Jan this past January between January sixth and tenth, and uh, they polled people about what their thoughts on the census. And there were some interesting things that came out of it. 90% um, of Americans considered the census as either very or somewhat important. Um, but the poll also found out that the respondents who rated the census as highly important didn't necessarily um, mean that they were going to participate or fill out their, um, and return their, uh, their forms. Um, the poll actually suggests that um, public awareness of the census and the mission was essential to participation. So that's part of why we're doing here, to get the word out and getting as many people to know what really goes on and what the census is about, to increase um, the, the amount of participation that we get. Um, some of the other stats that came out of it, 8% 8, 8 of the people that they polled said they had never heard of the census or knew anything about it. And only 25% within that group said they would even participate. Um, by contrast, 84% who knew about what the census was about, only 65% said they would participate. Um, so there's no real answer within the poll why this happens. Um, so what we're trying to do is get the word out to make sure everyone understands why it's so important. Um, another interesting uh, points that came out of this uh, poll was a significant um, majority of both African American and Latinos said that the census was very important as compared to 50, 50, um, 
as compared to whites. Um, but yet, when you, when you were asked the question whether or not you would fill out your forms and mail it back, the percentages dropped drastically and actually more white people would fill, said that they would fill out the census as opposed to people of color. Um, and there, again, there's lots of thoughts about why that happens and some, maybe some of the discussions we'll have will bring that out. Um, so it's really important, it's held every 10 years and um, it is based, part of the information that is used is, uh, will distribute more than 400 billion government resources in, and part of redistricting, so that's why it's really important to get the word out. So what I'd like to now do is introduce the panelists. Uh, the first person here to my right is Barbara Bugo, from the is a, who is a census, uh, census partnership specialist from the Boston office. And um, to her right is uh, Don Kilgas, who is a BCC history inst uh, instructor. And just to Don's right is Abu Muro, who is a student senator, who will also bring his, uh, he's also an international student and bring his perspective on what's going on with the census. And by the way, my name is Bob Rezendis. I'm one of the co-chairs of the committee. Um, and I'll be help moderating the discussion. So we'll get started with um, Barbara. Do you want to do your short presentation? And we'll be working from the desk from this point on. Thank you, and good afternoon. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, this is my second um, go-round as a partnership specialist for the Federal Census Bureau. And yes, it is extremely important, just as you heard. Um, many people care about the dollars. Um, $400 billion per year. I just mentioned to your panel I did a presentation at an elementary school this morning and when you try to tell the students $400 billion per year are um, based in part on the data from the census that come back to cities and towns. When I asked them about a decennial census, what does the word decennial mean? Of course you know, once every 10 years. But then when I ask them then what does that mean in dollars over the period of time between census 2000 and 2010, and then again between 2010 and 2020 when we do the census again? There are too many zeros for most people to count, but of course your professor knew right away. Four trillion dollars come back into cities and towns based in part on census data. You also care, I'm sure, about representation. We have 10 congressionals, congressional seats for Massachusetts at this point in time. Um, I'm sure your professor will talk more about that. I will tell you that in Census 2000, we lost a congressional seat. In 90, we lost a congressional seat. Of course, it's fair distribution of numbers so if Massachusetts looks like it is losing population, then fairly we lose another congressional seat based on how they are divided. However, if what you just heard from Bob is the fact that most of us, we're talking Black History Month, this is interesting for me, many of you folks say that it's very, very important, but a smaller proportion return those questionnaires we not only have to figure out why or try to educate people on the importance of it, we have to let them know that it certainly does make a huge difference with the funding for not only your city, your college, and your town or family, it certainly makes a difference for America. Like the film said, we are building a new portrait of America. We count everyone. Some of the undercounted groups, not only for blacks, black males are an undercounted group, 18 to 24, college students. Because many times, college students live in a rented apartment, and we know what happens. Everyone goes right away to the undocumented residents. We count undocumented residents. We are bound by a Title 13 oath that says we cannot divulge your personally identifiable information. We present the aggregate data, how many 
people live in Massachusetts, how many of a certain age, how many of a certain race, whatever you choose, but we cannot identify that there is a gentleman living in Fall River who works at BCC, who is your history professor of this age, because it would be directly indicating this person probably, and that's too much personally identifiable information. But the general data of the age group, of the, the race and gender, certainly we need to know along with the numbers. I want to stress that people say undocumented residents might be a little timid, a little afraid, sometimes a lot afraid, because they don't want the government to come back against them for any reason, some of them we already know, but that confidential oath we take, Title 13, I am sworn for life not to give out any personally identifiable information to anyone. It's a $250,000 fine and or five years in jail. It has been upheld several times. In the 50s, the president, they were, they were painting the White House and they wanted to move the president and the family away from the White House and ask the federal government, ask the Census Bureau, I should say, about information just about the neighbors. It was not given because we have an oath, because we are bound by law. The responsible parties who wanted this, of course, Secret Service, I, yeah, FBI, said they will take the Census Bureau to court. And they did. And the Supreme Court upheld the Title 13 law. We cannot, we will not. We take our data stewardship very, very seriously, or we could not have a complete and accurate census going forward. So, why else do people not trust the census or not, not feel comfortable sending it back? Because they sometimes believe, like we just said about college students, it's not that, you're, that college students are more dishonest or more afraid or more, more lax in, about doing their political um, duty. Um, they also sometimes live in apartments we know that maybe you've told your landlord there's one person living there. And maybe how many are really living there? It might be three, it might be four, it might be five. Someone might, you know, want to sleep on the couch. It might have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a cousin that stays over. There might be five buddies that all stay there. You don't want your landlord to know. We don't ask, we don't tell. We have over 300 colleges and universities in the Boston region. Our Boston region includes all of the New England states, upstate New York and Puerto Rico. If out of all those 300 colleges and universities, we have even 10% of the students not filling out their forms and mailing them back, we're talking huge numbers in our region. For Massachusetts, we're talking big numbers. Bristol Community College is a partner of ours. We are certainly grateful. We have been giving out information and education for months about the census. However, we haven't reached everyone yet. So we would like you to be our ambassadors. Take what you've learned from here. Bring it forward. Remember that it is safe. It is easy. It's important. This year, this census is the shortest census ever. 10 questions, 10 minutes. I brought some of these information pieces to remind us, and they're good data tools, that we do an American community survey all the other years between the censuses. It's the sampling survey that we need to get the other long form data that we used to do one every six censuses. I mean, one every six households. And so for 2010, we're doing the 10 questions, 10 minutes, the easiest census, quickest, shortest census ever. What I also want to say is there are other hard to count populations and for those of you who are parents who live here and go to school here, five and under happens to also be a very hard to count population. 
they are left off the census many, many times. I've talked to folks and they have said, well, with my city census, it says that if you don't fill out your census form within two or three census um, terms, years, then you might get left off the voting roster. Well, and you're 18 and over. So sometimes people think five and under don't count. We don't have to put the children down yet. They're not in school. They don't actually kind of benefit from the school programs, from the grants, from the, the free lunch programs. But how, do, how does everyone put, um, benefit? Your funds, we have 50 ways that we use the census and I can get you that information. The funding is not only for your schools, your buildings here, to help with federal dollars coming back based on uh, grant money and, and the things that we know we need here. But how about for your fire stations? I had someone in New Bedford talk to me about closing a fire station. How do we get the numbers up showing that w we, we really have that amount, that we could maybe get funding to maybe reach 100,000 in New Bedford or 100,000 in Fall River to say that we really have that amount of people that we're servicing. We can't do anything about that now. That was Census 2000. This is Census 2010. We can do something about that for now going forward to 2020. You want the correct amount of money coming back in your city or town, coming back to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, based on census numbers, the brochures that we have, the tagline that we have says it all. It is in our hands. And that's what we have here. 2010 census, it's in our hands. We do our job. We can, we must do our job. Our information has to be on the president's desk by December 31st. April 1st, 2010 is census day. The questionnaires will go into the mail mid-March. We're a month away. And what we ask is that you take that questionnaire as soon as you get it you fill it out, you fill it out accurately, and you mail it back. Many people say, well, I don't want someone coming to my door. We will have to come to the door for everyone that we don't get a form back from. We have acronyms in the federal government, we call it NERFU, non-response follow-up. We educate you folks so that you fill out the questionnaire, you mail it back, and probably no one will need to come to your door unless there's maybe a quality check, an accuracy check from time to time. But we are trying to increase the non, I mean decrease the non-response rate, increase the automatic mail out, mail back rate. So with everything you're gonna to learn today, hope it encourages you to say, this is so important, our future depends on it. We are making a new portrait of America and you being part of this census could help us have the best census ever. Thank you. Next we'll have a short presentation by Don Kilgus uh, about the his, a little bit of history behind the U.S. Census. Thank you very much. Um, my background obviously is in history and government and I thought I'd talk a little bit about why the census is required in the first place from a political point of view. And we all know that obviously in 1787, when the founding fathers came together in Philadelphia to draft a new constitution, a new government for this nation, what they created was a republic a government in which elected representatives are chosen by the people to manage the government for the people. And at that convention, one of the greatest questions that arose was exactly how the people and how the states would actually be represented. And there was a big conflict between the large states that wanted only uh, representation based on population because they wanted to dominate the Congress, they wanted to dominate what went on, and the small states that, feel, that felt that their rights would be taken away if they were completely in the minority perpetually. And that really was an impasse in the convention that they agonized over throughout the spring and summer of 1787 for weeks and weeks at times. 
until finally the Connecticut delegation uh, came up with a compromise, what became known as the Connecticut or the Great Compromise, whereby we would have two separate bodies in our legislative branch, the Senate, which would have equal representation from all the states to obviously please and to placate the small states, and the population would determine the representation in the House of Representatives, the lower house, the house that was obviously closer to the people's influence. And according to the original Constitution, the original wording of the Constitution, there were supposed to be one representative in the house for every 30,000 people. And that was a way, obviously, for the large states to have their representation, and they could dominate, obviously, the House of Representatives. Well, since representation in the House is based on population, the question arose, obviously, we have to count and figure out the number of, of Americans every so many years. And the reason we have a census every 10 years is because it's constitutionally mandated. In Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, it is constitutionally mandated that we have a census every 10 years. Now, that statistic I threw out a second ago, one representative for every 30,000 people, obviously that's no longer feasible today because with a population of over 280 million according to the last census in 2000 we would have over 9,000 representatives in the House of Representatives today. We, Congress I should say, capped the number at 435 back in 1929 because even back in 1929 the numbers were beginning to get out of control in terms of representation. So that actually changed how now we have to do the census and how we refigure a process called redistricting and reapportionment that I'll speak about in one second. But what's important to keep in mind as well, I think, is that this census and the census in the U.S. Constitution was a radical, radical break with past traditions. I mean, in the past, censuses has been taken to to figure out taxes or to confiscate property from citizens or even to decide who would be um, drafted into the military. For our census, though, that was created in our Constitution, it was actually a way to empower the people politically, to give them actually a voice and representation within the government, which was a radical, radical change from what we'd seen, obviously, previously. But what happens basically now is that after every census is done every 10 years, what we basically have to do, and there's a much more complicated formula by the census, but the one that I use in class, which basically works just as well, is that what we do is we figure out what the entire population of the United States is. At the last census, it was around 280 plus million people. Then we divide that by 435, since that number of representatives is fixed. And basically, that number in um, 2000 was around 650,000 people. And then basically, the way we figure it now is within the states, as they relatively change their population, increasing or decreasing as population shifts happen in this country, as states, per, you know, percentage-wise, increase or lose population, for every 650 or, th or so thousand people, that state will get an extra representative in Congress after the census, or that state will have to lose. And that's basically how we figure it out every, every 10 years, a process known as reapportionment. What is done by the U.S. federal government is reapportionment, which is basically informing the states if they have been, um, if they've gained, relatively speaking, in population or lost, and whether they will therefore be gaining a representative in the House or actually be losing a representative in the House as well. Massachusetts, as Barbara mentioned a few minutes ago, actually had been losing representation for after many of the censuses of the 20th century. What's interesting is in the 18 teens, Massachusetts, at the time when it still also had uh, Maine as part of Massachusetts, had uh, 20 members of the House of Representatives. Today that number, as Barbara said, is down to only 10. And that has an impact in a number of different ways, as we'll talk about, in, and I'll give you some background one second in terms of the election uh, procedure as well. Um, after a state is told that it's gained a seat or lost a seat, what then happens is a process called redistricting, where, and that happens at the state level, where the state intervenes, the state legislature makes the decision, uh, and actually, how the districts will be redrawn. And that's a very highly political process. It's a fascinating process to watch. But it's a process that's often referred to as gerrymandering. 
because it's a phrase that emanates from Massachusetts as well, from the uh, 1812 time period when Governor Elbridge Gerry actually had the state house, uh, the state legislature rather, um, redraw, they worked together to redraw a congressional district, not so that it was geographically compact, but rather so that it would almost virtually guarantee that his political ally would win re-election. And that type of gerrymandering has been very, very controversial throughout American history. And the Supreme Court has upheld um, in many decisions that political gerrymandering is perfectly fine to try to hurt the Democratic Party, Republican Party back and forth. That's perfectly fine. But when you gerrymander to purposely dilute minority voting strength, then the courts have upheld that that is not legal, that is not constitutional at all. And especially under the Voting Rights Act of, of um, the amendments of uh, 1982. So gerrymandering is one of the most important aspects, again, of this whole reapportionment process as well. And it all, again, emanates from the census data that we get. But another key question that arose at the Constitutional Convention was who are we going to count? That became one of the most vital questions. And of course, the Southerners wanted their slaves to count as people, even though at the time they were classified just as being chattel, just as being property. And as a result, the Northerners in many cases resisted, and th this was another impasse at the convention. But what they finally agreed to do is they came up with what I always say in my classes is one of the most infamous, one of the most embarrassing compromises within the US Constitution. And that is what is called the three-fifths compromise. Where basically what they said is that when we're figuring representation in the House of Representatives, for every five slaves, we will count three as people towards representation in the House. Obviously, they're not going to free three out of every five slaves. They were not going to give them the right to vote. They were not going to give them any types of freedoms. But nevertheless, they were just going to use it to basically increase the political power of the southern states. And that's exactly what happened. Now, keep in mind, the old percentage that I spoke of earlier, one representative for every 30,000 people was in place right up until 1929. So it was in place right up to and after the American Civil War when slavery was finally abolished. So if you think about it, for every 100,000 slaves, that would give a southern state two more representatives in the House of Representatives. A greater voice, obviously. In 1789, the slave population of the US was about 750,000 people. If you do multiply that out by three-fifths and then divide by 30,000, that adds up to about 15 representatives more that the southern states received because of their slave population. By 1860, that population of slaves was up to three and a half million. And that gave southerners about 70 more representatives. Now, greater representation in the House to push through their legislation or to prevent northern legislation and things, that can be, you know, obviously bad enough. But when you add another component to this as well, at the Constitutional Convention, what they also decided is that when the states are electing the president, that the number of electoral votes each state would have was equal to the number of senators a state ha had, which was obviously two, every state had two, plus the number of reps in the House that a state had. So basically what we're talking about here is not just that the Southerners by 1860 had 70 more representatives in the House, they also had 70 more electoral votes to guarantee that perhaps a Southerner or someone with Southern sympathies would be elected President of the United States. And when you look at the information and when you look at the span of the American presidents between 1789 to 1860, almost all of them, save perhaps the Adamses, fit into one or two categories. Either they were slave owners themselves, or they were what were called doe faces. And what a doe face was, was a northern politician who had southern leanings or southern sympathies and basically obviously compromised or agreed or at least um, went along with the southern policies and along with protecting slavery as well. So when you look at that, and even in one election, for example, just, just pick one out of all of them, in 1800, 
John Adams, as historians have calculated, that he was the first president to fall victim to the three-fifths compromise. Because they have calculated that John Adams, who lost the presidential election that year to Thomas Jefferson, that Adams actually would have won the presidential election if the three-fifths compromise was not in place by an electoral vote of 63 to 61. Very narrow election, but John Adams, obviously from the Commonwealth, lost and was regarded as the first victim, if you will, of the three-fifths compromise in presidential elections. Slavery, as we know, was not officially abolished until 1865, uh, at the very end, right at the, after the Civil War had ended, the 13th Amendment had been ratified at, in December of 1865. And although Amendment 13 did abolish slavery, it did not address the issue of that three-fifths representational formula. As a matter of fact, that was not addressed until the 14th Amendment in 1868, and the 14th Amendment read that representation shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. Thank you very much, and that's just a little bit of historical background. We're going to be starting our question and answering period, and, uh, and anyone can ask any question about anyone on the panel. Um, I'm going to start first by actually asking Abu a question um, as the student representative. Um, what does the census mean to you? Uh, thank you. In my personal view, I see, I see a census in a positive direction. Census, as we all know, is the head count of the people living in any geographical area. And in the U.S., it's one of our constitutional mandate to conduct census in every 10 years. And this helps us in numerous ways. As my professor said earlier, it helps us in our representative in the U.S. House of Representatives. So all these things has a benefit. And it's not only rep, it's, always, it's also help us in apportionation of over $400 billion, which is being spent across our communities in the US here. So it's always a great endeavor for us to participate to make this census a good one. Because census, as we know, is helping us in a numerous ways. Even in US here, we have different kind of activists people who always I ask for their rights, who always seek for their rights. And if you are living in any geographical area, for instance, in Commonwealth here, Massachusetts here, and you don't have a lot of people uh, to ask for you, and if you, if you don't have a lot of people to ask for you and you are seeking for any favor on your side, you will never get it. Because if they see that you have a lot of population in your geographical area, they will see that these people have the mass number. So anything that they are seeking for, it will be given to them easily. To uh, tell you my, I, uh, my perception and my views that I, I see in Ghana, Ghana is one of the developing countries in Africa. And we had our independence from the British colony around 1957. And after, after the, this independence, we had our republic in 1st first, first of July, 1960. And after that, we draw our first constitution for our country in the, in, the, in the year 1960. And we also saw that counting, counting the head of people in every area to determine the number of representatives that they will have in, in the parliament in Ghana is one of the essential things for us to do. So we also, uh, we also draw that line that every 10 years we will, or every 10 years we will, we will count the, the number of people in every geographical area to, uh, to know the number of people who can represent them in the parliament. And, and, that one, and if there is any problem too, I, census is, the figures are used for uh, different ways. It can also be used to rescue people. Exam example like our current disaster who took place in Haiti here. If they don't know the number of people living in any geographical area, it will be uneasy for them to determine the number of victims who have been affected by the, by the earthquake or by that natural disaster. So this is always good for us to determine numbers. 
So in terms of in terms of numbers, we don't we don't joke with it. Numbers are essential in everything. If you have number one and someone is having number five, you are always behind that person because that person is higher than you. And to go back to, uh, to Ghana, like the history that I was given. So from 1960 that we had our republic, there was numerous, we started doing uh, every counting every 10 years. The, fir the first one was done in 1970. And we had an about 80% of the people participated. And it, it, it made that uh, census in a, in a good way. And from that, we started talking to people and telling the people the essence of the census. And I almost every Ghanaian, I got to know that the census is in their, uh, in their competitive advantage when, whenever they are seeking for anything from the government. So in, if you go to Ghana right now, if they are doing census, even a young child of two years wants his name to be written down. This is the essence of the census that we have been doing. So I will, I will encourage everyone to take part and send the message, the gospel to everyone, that the census is what you made. And the right decision that you make today is always a good thing for you in the future. And this, uh, the census are, are done every 10 years. If the census is being, is being done this year, know that you will not get any census again unless next 10 years. And this number will be used at any time. So if you have two, two this I uh, two number two, and next year even if your number increase, they will never know. So they will just use the number two to maybe multiply by a factor to know the number of people in that area. So if there is any benefit, you will get you will get from that I uh, census. So I think all of us have to take part and send the gospel to everyone that the census always help us. So we must, I, 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 we must stand up and do our best to make this census a success. Thank you. Okay. So I have a number of questions myself, but I kind of want to hold on to it. And, and uh, offer anyone who uh, has a question for any of the panelists, if you want to just raise your hand. All right. I have a question for the uh, census representative. <clears throat> what mechanisms are in place to ensure that there's not an overcount in any particular area? Thank you very much. I mentioned earlier that you would not be getting a call at your house, a person to your door, um, if you filled it out and mailed it back, except, and I said briefly, a quality assurance. So this is what we, we do. You know, in every count, everything you do, there is a plus or minus factor in there, that, that, the differential that, that, you, that we place in there. But what happens is we have a quality team, and that's why we have the certain forms for, to come out, um, that go out to you. They, are, uh, they have the, the bar, you know, the barcode on it. And that's why we ask for your name and address. People say, if you just want number of people, why do you need my name and address? Because we have an address database that we have defined. You saw some folks out in the streets with the handheld computers last spring. We get every address in the country that we can, and then we respond by um, mid-April to the addresses that did not send it back. That way, we are able to do a quality check to make sure there's one household counted in, in the number for every household in America. We also have, um, we, we say the mail out, the mail back. We do a, um, an operation called um, update leave. So there are places in our area, in my area, I actually am out of the office in New Bedford. There are certain places where we don't mail it out and mail it back because there are P.O. boxes and who would get it. So we go right to the door and we do an update leave. But for every operation we have, we have a quality assurance team that helps us define that yes we've gotten them everyone that is supposed to be counted and no we have not gotten duplicates or any erroneous data as far as we can quality check okay my question is why is it seems like the 
people of color and low income are disproportionately, disproportionately undercounted. Well, I think that there's obviously been a long history, um, I think, uh, among many different groups in America of, I think it's, it's, some say it's fear, I think to some extent, um, like uh, Barbara spoke of earlier, that's why I didn't know if you were going to take this question as well, um, but the idea that the government will somehow, they'll have information about me and as a result they'll come after me, for example. I know from a personal anecdotal point of view, um, back in 1999 here at BCC in one of my classes, I had a student ask me, it wasn't a government class, it was an ancient history class, about what the census was all about. And he said, well, he said, I, I don't want to fill it out. And I said, well, you should because it's, it's you know, based on, you know, of the apportionment. It, it deals with federal funding coming to your community and coming to your school and all these different things. And he said, well, but he said, I, I don't want them to know where I am. And I thought that was an interesting comment, an interesting question. And I'm like, well, they won't know where you are and things. And as Barbara just mentioned, the insurances and the oath that they take. But I think that's part of the fear that someone will find out, you know, like she said, that more people are living there or I'm an odd, uh, undocumented, you know, immigrant or whatever the case may be. And therefore, I think it's, it's a lot of fear. Um, it could be also at times lack of knowledge about what the census is and what it's doing and the benefits of what it can do. So I think it, it kind of ties in with a lot of those issues. And I don't know, Barbara, if you wanted to say some other things too. I would, thank you. That's basically it. And if you think about it, um, many times there are folks who just have come to this country. We want to talk about the immigrants. We want to talk about the, the, the minorities, and I can. Folks who have immigrated to this country, uh, maybe they've come from places that are not so friendly with the census or not so well educated with the census as we are and don't understand that it really is a, an oath that we take and it really is totally confidential. However, it also sometimes is that they just don't trust people who aren't like them. So I have to say to you that the census has also hired on and wants to hire people from your own city, your own town, your own community, your own language skills so that we can go in and explain to them that this is why we do this in your own language so that you understand. People will tell me, I will hear it from you, but maybe I wouldn't hear it from somebody else because I'm Cape Verdean and people in that Cape Verdean community will tell me that. I talked to someone who spoke Spanish in Attleboro and they said, we went to a household and the folks that went there maybe looked like your professor, let's be honest. And they asked the number in the household and the mother and father, there were just two. When the woman went back with a representative and spoke Spanish and was able to educate that family on how important it was and what the census was used for, some of it for health care, some of it for schools, some of it for the free lunch programs for the children, they got a different answer. Yes, grandmother and grandfather were here, they just came over. Yes, we have a niece staying with us. Yes, we have a child. So all of a sudden, there were seven people in that household and not just two. When we use the tools that we have, like the college and universities program we have here, educating schools, census in schools, when we use the faith-based program that we have, when we, when we send people to your door, more like me, that you might just feel more comfort level with or an understanding, an educational linguistic barrier is released and erased and then people feel more comfortable. I can't say that, I, I don't want to say that what you heard about the history of the census is also not true. When you hear about it, because we're here in Black History Month, I will say that. Because I will also talk to you for a second about the fact that we do have a, um, an American Indian partnership specialist or two in upstate New York. It's not just here. The American Indians have that kind of uh, hesitation with the government, and I'll just use that word gently, and we know why. So when I say maybe African Americans have a difficult time with the census or other populations, there's a history 
as to why, but your professor just explained it so well that that was an old history. We are trying to help you understand the new reality is it's safe, it's important, and it really helps your community and your family. That's the important part we need to know now. So if you explain to everyone that way, we'll erase that barrier of fear and we'll get to a complete and accurate census. Oh, hi. Uh, just ask you one, I have like two questions, but the first one is what you just explained. For example, um, I do elections at City Hall. I'm a clerk for Walt VC, which is people from my neighborhood. Um, the issue is, like you were talking about the elections and the census, if they don't have their census date, they have like an I, an active next to their name on a, when you go check in and stuff. Uh, is there a thing because I have a few people that I helped fill out the census, mailed, especially my family, where I mailed it out back to City Hall. And every year, it's like when we go vote, it's like inactive. They say, no, you didn't fill your census. I'm like, wait a minute. I personally mailed it, and the second time, I dropped it off. So there's an issue with City Hall, like town halls and stuff. And I don't think they're doing a great job when the census are turned in because of all these people who I've helped, and now it's like they come to vote and they get mad at me because you filled out the census, you helped me. That's my first question. I still have a second. What's the question? Oh, no, uh, oh, well, the question is like when, with the census, when you were talking about the elections, where people come to vote and stuff, where if they don't fill out the census, they have, I guess it's called an inactive next to their name when they go to check in to receive their ballot. Where I've dealt with uh, people who've voted who have filled out their census, but when it goes to City Hall, City Hall doesn't really uh, submit that information in. Well, I think, um, first of all, I think what the, the key is also that I think when the cities get these, the roles for the voting roles, as you mentioned, so-and-so is inactive and things, what they're trying to do is obviously clamp down on the, the tradition and the corruption that has occurred throughout American history with the old political machinery and things like that, that I see dead people and they vote, you know, kind of mentality kind of thing, and they vote often and things. So I think they're trying to do that with the inactive status and how the census data obviously will affect it directly. They don't have the people's names per se, but what they are informed of how many people who live in that community. The other records that would help you provide is when you actually go to register to actually vote um, and when you change your residence and you do the motor voter registration or things of that sort. Um, and perhaps if you haven't voted, I believe it's in, at least depends on the state, every state's a little bit different, but um, at least one or two election cycles, um, off your elections and presidential election years, then you would get that inactive status listed next to your name. Um, the census data is a little bit different in the sense that that is kind of a blind information that you have. Um, but also uh, what Barbara was speaking about as well um, was about the children five and under who are undercounted as well that would kind of figure into some of those things that you had mentioned as well about school programs and things. I don't know if Barbara if you want to talk more about that. But I had mentioned your local census as an example as to why maybe some folks don't include the children. But what I, he helped, um, your professor helped clarify what your local census does. However, I don't want um, the misinformation to go out of here that we do anything with the census based on your local city or town voting roster or anything like that because that is not what we do. We just get the numbers. Whatever is happening in your city and town locally, you, you need to address with your local city and town. This is the federal decennial census. This year we're asking you to fill out maybe a second or a third census this time. It is the federal one. It will come to your door next month. It hasn't come yet. And I use that as an example to say, these are reasons why people confuse what they should or should not do based on children, based on voting and kinds of things like that. The census, this 
federal decennial census has to do with congressional representation, redistricting, getting that $4 trillion back into your city and town. We count everyone. And I mentioned about our region, we said the United States, of course we know, talking from someone who's from a different country, we know that the census also, that we also are not just the United States and her properties. So we count, of course, U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam. Sometimes people ask me, and I don't, shouldn't even say this, but um, Puerto Rico, that's ours too. Or they say to my, my, my partner, you're from Puerto Rico. Are you counted in the census? Well, we know here we're in college. Of course, Puerto Rico is, one, is part of us. But it, it's a large operation. We need to get the right information everywhere. And for you to understand that everyone counts in the census, documented or not, as long as you are a resident in the United States and her properties. And your city census and the other voting and the children has, is, is not, uh, does not um, affect what we do in this federal census. Does that help your question? Help answer your question? Thank you. Uh, the thing with the uh, immigration, you were saying non-citizens, like, for example, uh, where I used to live a few years ago, back when in 2000 or 1990 with the, the census filling out, where I was helping uh, a friend of my mother's fill out her census, the federal census, where she had an uncle living with her who was, who came here um, from Portugal, but he was here illegal and stuff. She didn't want me to mock him on the census because she was afraid of INS might come and stuff like that. Which I kind of think that federal, like Bob just told me, was just they want to know how many people. They only need to know if you're documented or not. Perfect, perfect, thank you. That's a great one to bring up. That's exactly what I mentioned about the person who speaks in another language or understands your culture. It helps me to bring up the, the, the point that in another couple of weeks, we are going to be hiring folks for the census, part-time, temporary jobs. Um, our recruiting assistant, is uh, Dawn Cadero over here, and she would be able to talk to you about hiring because you need to be 18 and over, you need to be a U.S. citizen. At this point in time, we have so many of our citizens out of work. You need to pass a basic skills 28 question questionnaire um, test, and then um, we will run a federal background check because we are all sworn federal employees. But Questionnaire assistance centers will be opening all over the cities and towns in the areas, especially hard to count populations, like you said, um, residents who maybe are, are from a different culture, from a different country, or someone said lower income, and I forgot about that. I'll get to that in one second. Questionnaire assistance centers will be, will be open from March 19th, approximately, until April 19th. For those folks who don't understand the culture, want help in saying, should I or shouldn't I, we already know we don't work with the INS. We already told you we could need, we up, had upheld in the, con in the Supreme Court about the president. We don't share this information with anyone. We must get that data. That gentleman needed to be included because for every household that doesn't include one of those, we're missing a lot of federal dollars in your city and town. So we're going to hire folks about 15 hours a week speaking another language, coming from a different country. As long as you're a U.S. citizen and you pass that test, we are looking forward to having you so that you can help educate the folks in your community. The other thing, sir, about, um, about low income. It isn't just because low income maybe doesn't participate. It isn't sometimes anything to do about with um, education because some folks who are very highly educated have, maybe this is their first time out of the household and they're doing their census for the first time and they don't understand. What happens many times with rental folks is they move a lot. So maybe we've gotten someone to get the census form but they're moving and they're not at the same place they were. We have to try to catch that. Sometimes people have significant others living with them that are maybe in a rental place that they say, I don't want you to tell my landlord. We don't ask, we don't tell. So those are the reasons why sometimes 
either minority populations, um, undocumented residents, or lower income possibly do not fill out the census. There are many, many reasons, but if we educate everyone on the importance and the real fact that it is confidential, then we should have a much better count this year, much more accurate count than ever before. Another question? Hi, two, two questions. Number one, over the past 50 years, have there been some interesting trends in regards to the census in the state of Massachusetts? And number two, um, are there any unfavorable habits as far as this part of Massachusetts when it comes to filling out the census? The census, yes. Well, I think the, the biggest trend in the last 50, actually even go back even further than that, is the fact that the population in this country and therefore affecting Massachusetts is shifting dramatically. That Massachusetts, relative to the rest of the nation, has been losing in population over the last 50 plus years, so that um, after the, the different censuses, for example, as, as Barbara mentioned earlier and I addressed as well, um, Massachusetts is now down to 10 representatives in the House, whereas as late as, and let me just get the number here, because I have it written down, um, in terms of as late as, um, for example, where is that number? Oh, had in 1960, Massachusetts had 14 representatives in the House. So in the last just 30, 40 years, they've lost, Massachusetts has lost, uh, we have lost four um, uh, representatives in the House, therefore four electoral votes. Um, so that's really the biggest trend that I think you can really see. I think in the southeastern part of Massachusetts, one of the biggest trends probably that we've seen in, in terms of uh, trends in general has been the increase in the different languages and the obstacles for different um, you know, immigrant groups and minority groups to obviously have a chance to understand these census forms, to actually go and actually have an opportunity to have them in different languages. And I think the government is trying to address that issue more and more. And Robert just said, mentioned as well, the idea about the, the partnership. Well, you can address this. This is just, I, you just handed me this. But it's interesting because it is the language issue, I think, is probably the biggest challenge, whether it be the Portuguese language or other languages that are coming in you know, and settling in Fall River and New Bedford in the last um, 40, 50 years as well. And again, over some of those stereotypes and the fears as well um, about people actually uh, taking part. But the biggest issue for me from a governmental point of view is obviously the loss of representation is the biggest thing. And here, let me let Barbara. I'm glad you brought up the language program. I brought that with me as well. Um, not in every area, so don't quote me with this. Many, many areas that are like large populations of Spanish speakers, the forms will be sent out in English and Spanish. So folks will understand and, and feel like they, they really are participating and can participate without too much help from a questionnaire assistance center. In uh, promotional materials, we have, um, we have promotional materials in almost 28 different, in 28 different languages. I shouldn't even say almost, it's here on my pyramid. As language assistance guides, when we go, when we host the questionnaire assistance centers, if we have someone from a different country like Ghana and they speak their own language and it's not something that we're so familiar with here that maybe uh, I have a Cape Verdean friend who can speak six languages and he is from Angola. Um, and, oh, no, I'm sorry, he's from Senegal, but he speaks Wolof as well. I would not be able to un understand that. But the Portuguese and the Cape Verdean Creole and the Spanish, I can understand a little bit of in, in English. However, we have what they call language guides. So if someone comes to me at a questionnaire assistance center and they do not, I do not have someone to interpret in their language, and around here it really is a lot of Portuguese, a lot of Spanish, or, you know, some of, we have guides that you can point to, and it just says, I speak this language, and we have a language line, we have phones that we can call someone and use the language line to help them understand it. And partnership staff, linguistic capabilities, for those of us partnered, there are 56 partnership specialists in the Boston region, and then we have partnership specialists for all of the other regions around the United States. Totally, we speak 101 languages. So that should be helpful to anyone who needs to understand in another language and make them feel more comfortable. One more, and then we'll wrap it up. 
Thank you. Um, will there be a possibility of um, uh, people who are not employed, the employee of the census, uh, knocking at the doors of people pretending to do census, who are not actually uh, uh, commissioned by the census? Did I hear you say, is there a possibility for people to work for the census that are not really commissioned by or, or help the census that are not really? What we have, what we um, have created, like with um, Dr. Sprager here, and I thank you for, for being here as well, your president. In Fall River specifically, we have created uh, months ago a complete count committee with leaders of the community like Dr. Sprager and um, other uh, leaders, educational as well as business, as well as um, non-governmental um, uh, services. We have folks that will help us along the way to get the word out, to do like you did here, invite the Census Bureau to be a part of your, your discussions, um, all sorts of things, but they cannot take the census unless you are a federal employee. Why again? Even with the questionnaire assistance centers last time, we tried to staff them with volunteers who knew the language, but unless we can be confident that you have taken that oath and your information will be kept confidential, we take the, the, the chance with a volunteer getting this information, unless you've asked me to. If he says that, that you're a volunteer and he wants his professor to help him with it, that's fine. But we cannot staff the questionnaire assistance centers in the B counted sites and places like this with folks that are not working for the federal government officially because they have to take that oath of confidentiality. Okay? And I just wanted to say also that um, when someone comes to your door, please open it for them if you have not sent your, sent your uh, questionnaire back because we will have to come back again and again we will call we we're going to do it five six seven times we have to and it'll be bumped up to our supervisor because it is mandated it is certainly that important so please do okay <clears throat> for our closing co uh, comments i'd like to uh, invite uh president jack Sprega to come up Thank you. I uh, didn't have anything prepared. I wanted to say uh, how important, and you've heard uh, throughout the panel discussion, uh, how important this project is for the country, uh, first of all, but also for Massachusetts, second of all, and thirdly, uh, for uh, our, south, our southeastern Massachusetts region. It's absolutely important. I remember as a child that we had 16 electoral votes, as uh, Professor Kilgus pointed out, 14 representatives and two senators, and uh, we had a little, uh, you know, a good deal of power in the country in those days. Uh, but people are moving to the Sun Belt, and uh, uh, if you see the uh, census uh, in terms of uh, Florida and uh, Arizona, uh, people are leaving what has become known as the Rust Belt up in uh, uh, Michigan and Wisconsin and Ohio, and Minnesota, uh, and uh, our northeastern uh, region uh, with the suffering of the uh, manufacturing and other uh, social and cultural activity, uh, uh, opportunities elsewhere. Uh, Massachusetts has declined. I think you said we were down to 10 uh, representatives now. Uh, and we face the prospect uh, we're really on the cutting edge of losing at least one more seat unless this census, as has been pointed out, it's very uh, important that we pick up every possible uh, count. Uh, and I can remember also those days when people didn't trust the government officials knocking on the door and didn't want to open the door. Uh, and uh, it, it, it really does hurt the uh, region, hurts each city. The mayor of New Bedford, the mayor of Fall River, Taunton and Attleboro, they are absolutely on board about making sure that every resident is, uh, is counted. Uh, every count is so important, especially uh, when we're on the, Massachusetts on the kind of a cutting edge of losing yet another seat. So we have to be sure we stay above that, uh, that, that level. 
Uh, I was very pleased to hear about the historical uh, views uh, and uh, uh, tr development of the census. It uh, uh, traced back to the uh, founding fathers and the compromise for the three-fifths, as was pointed out. Uh, the, uh, the northerners, if you will, uh, or anti-slavery uh, people agreed to the uh, three-fifths only in conjunction with the companion piece that the census be, ta be taken every 10 years. Uh, the idea at that time, uh, 1788, was that slavery was on its way out. It was a peculiar institution and uh, would die out of its own uh, uh, faults, if you will. Uh, and then along came Eli Whitney in uh, 1792 and uh, uh, cotton and the cotton gin and it became uh, much more than uh, than uh, people had anticipated when they first agreed to the, do the census every 10 years. Uh, so uh, I thank you for coming. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bob for uh, this is one of a, a wide array of uh, African American History Month activities at the college. Uh, please do uh, t take advantage of uh, participating. I can't say enough of the value that we have in the census, and I thank you for coming and helping us out. The complete count is certainly the key word here. And the last thing I want to say is, as I say every uh, uh, African American History Month, is that it's not a month or Women's History Week. It's not a week. It's uh, something that we celebrate uh, year round. Uh, uh, we celebrate diversity. We embrace our diversity. It makes us a stronger institution. And uh, so don't, uh, February 28th, you don't put all your African American history materials away and wait till next February 1st. Uh, so I thank you very much. Please, if you know people about the census, uh, reassure them that there's no secret plot uh, by the government. And in fact, it will help. Uh, it will help southeastern Massachusetts. Thank you very much, and again, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Dr. Sprager. Thank you. And I would be remiss if we didn't mention our liaison here, Kathleen Burns, and we are going to have a census road tour van stop right here. Kathleen, wanna just tell us a little bit about that? Census officials that will be here giving you information. They have freebies for you. We'll also have some of the local people, um, different different um, people who want to express how important it is to have everybody have some kind of count on that. I think that's one thing that you really got to get across to everybody. You should have filled one out. You're an adult. You should have filled one out. Somebody in your household has to fill one out. We really want to get that word out. So February 25th, 10 to 2. Okay, thank you. Uh, just last bit of announcements is about the rest of some of our events we're happening, uh, that we're having here. Um, next Wednesday at 11 a.m. here in the cafeteria, we're gonna have a fabulous storyteller, Valerie Tutson, who will be here to perform for about 45 minutes. She is really, really good. Um, the, the, the following day, Thursday, is our, uh, the National African American Read-In that will be happening in H Building. Uh, for all additional events, please check the online events calendar through our BCC's web page. Uh, thank you all for coming.